Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, this is the Pet Care Innovation Prize uh, Startup Series webinars. This session is um, the uh, session from Bootstrap to Scale, the strategy of pet care company growth. Uh, our presenters today are uh, Jim Vonderheit of InnoVentures and Hillary Jensen of Obi. Um, you should have a text, uh, a chat box to the left, um, uh, lower left, where you can uh, type in any questions. Um, it would be great if somebody would just let us know that you can hear, um, that, uh, that audio is good. Um, but uh, we want to get started. Thanks for your patience. We were, uh, uh, Hillary uh, has uh, just moved three time zones. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and she'll share that news here in just a moment. But uh, and uh, so we had a, a little bit of a confusion on um, who, uh, uh, what time she was supposed to be on. So we were just straightening that out, and we're here. So um, this, uh, the, our goal is to kind of introduce uh, some ideas in what needs to happen for a successful pet care entrepreneur, and. Um, and uh, we're going to do that today. Jim Vonderheit, who's got a, a great background in the pet care industry um, over several decades, is going to share with you um, uh, his perspective on uh, strategy and growth and, and innovation. And Hillary, who's um, uh, found some success, Hillary Jensen of Obi, um, she was the grand prize winner of last year's Pet Care Innovation Prize, our first Pet Care Innovation Prize. Um, and uh, she's going to actually then give kind of her personal um take on um what that's manifested like as, for an entrepreneur uh so uh really quickly this is uh this series is uh presented by the pet care innovation prize which is powered by nestle purina pet care and it's also presented by our friends at pet age uh pet age is a great resource uh for keeping up with what's going on in the trade and learning about the trade um I'll tell you a little bit about the Pet Care Innovation Prize at the end of this and how you can enter and why you may want to do that. Uh, but really quickly, I want to I want to just get to the meat of the webinar. Um, so we're going to start with Jim Vonderheit. Jim was one of the first mentors that we had um, with uh, with the Pet Care Innovation Prize. He's actually one of the um, one of the people that helps with the content for our boot camp. And um, Jim. Uh, comes uh, from a background uh, that he'll tell you about, but he really helped kind of explain uh, to us and kind of started laying the ground groundwork for what it looks like to build a strategy and why a strategy is important in pet care, um, both the both the idea and the execution. And uh, Jim, I've handed over control to you, and um, um, so let's get started. Can we confirm that um, people can hear us? Yeah, can somebody actually tell us, actually somebody type a note quick to make sure that we can hear you? Oh, hey, there we okay, go. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Jim, take it away. First of all, you have to tell us who you're holding in this picture. Uh, that is my uh, daughter's dog, Josie, and uh, she is one of uh, about, uh, I think we have five dogs in our family and uh, two cats. And so we are uh, we are big into adopting rescue pets and, as well as taking care of them. So uh, we have a very active pet owning household. And the biggest question that we have is whose pet gets to come for Christmas? Because <laughs> they don't all play together nicely. So this is Jim Vonderheit, and I'm here. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here because I think this pet innovation prize is really modeling a lot of what's been going on in the industry uh, from an investor perspective and a startup perspective and I've been part of that process for a long time. Yeah, I have a quick question. I've got a Q&A thing on my screen that I can't seem to get rid of. Can you tell me how to do that? You can just move that box away. That's if uh, if somebody has a question that they want to ask you, you can just drag that box. Okay, great. That way I can see the slide. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, that would be great. There you are. Uh, thanks. Uh, the point here is that, yeah, as Dan said, embarrassingly enough, I've been working in the pet food industry for over 40 years, and I'm still active uh, in that in the industry. Uh, I uh, I am I started my career uh, with the innovation as an advertising person uh, with the first soft dry pr product, which was 100 chunks, 
Then I spent 22 years at Purina, where I ran U.S. marketing for pet products. I was also involved with uh, uh, all. I was involved with all of the branding and product development activities there, as well as running R&D. And uh, I also did the business development. So through the years, I've looked at a lot of companies through the lens of uh, a large company. Uh, and since retiring from them, I, I've had an, uh, a startup mentoring service and a consulting business called Interventures. And along the way, we helped create a product called Rachel Ray Nutrish. We did the branding and innovation for them. Uh, I consulted extensively on the creation of Walmart Super Premium line. But, and more importantly, I, I formed my own company called Norg and Beverage. So uh, I've been on the advertising side, I've been on the corporate side, and I've been on the startup side, and I'm also an investor in a lot of startup companies. So the outline I wanted to talk to you about today is really uh, based on that experience and biased by that experience. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, the thing that I want to talk about first is that whenever a company is going in front of some form of investor group or a business development team, we have to understand that that we're presenting we're presenting to people with established industry biases, and they listen with their own mental model for what is appropriate not only for them, but are also for uh, their company. And as the result, we have to really make sure we understand where they're coming from. The other thing I want to talk about is that uh, the people that you're going to meet as part of your search and presenting to new company and presenting to investors and strategic investors is they're always listening for something new because this is an industry that has been has a history of disruption. I was at Purina when Hill Science Diet and Imes came along, and now Blue Buffalo has come along, and they changed the perspective. I mean, how silly could it be to try to sell a brand of pet food through veterinarians, right? I was also part of the experience when Walmart came along and changed the whole definition of how and where consumers shop for grocery products, including pet food. And they've changed everything, and Farm and Fleet and all those. And now with the online activity, including Chewy being purchased by PetSmart, this is an industry where it has been constantly under pressure from innovation. And companies like Obi and what Hillary is doing are just another set of examples of how the contour is always changing. You can go to the next slide. But the desired outcome for every business for entrepreneurs perspective is to recognize that we need to think about our business as being one that's being designed to be sold and investors when they come along are looking to make investments and are acquiring part of your business because they think as the result of that investment the total value of the enterprise will be increased they're looking to maximize shareholder value and even if we own a business for three or five or more years Every time we look at what we need to do, we need to be putting it in the context of how is this creating shareholder value? And as the next person is going to own a business, is it going to be more valuable to them? And of course, the quintessential example of that is the fact that we were a three and a half billion dollar enterprise at, Nest at Purina and Nestle came along and bought us. So even the biggest players in the industry are subject to acquisition and always need to be paying attention to the fact of creating shareholder value. Hey, Gemma, it's Dan. I just wanted to kind of, you know, there's probably some people on this call or, or listening to the recording of this, by the way. If you're listening, um, Jim's slides, Hillary's slides, and uh, the recording of this will be available on the Pet Care Innovation Prize website after this. But there's probably some people on here like, this is my baby. There's, there's no way I'm ever going to want to sell it. Um, is is it still important to think it from this perspective of of building shareholder value if you want to keep it privately held and and uh, and never sell it? Is that I it's mean very important? That's a very fair question, Dan. It's very important that uh, we always we, we manage. I mean, think about it. Every year, a company has an annual meeting, and one of the things they do implicitly, if not explicitly, is decide whether or not the current ownership 
is the best way to go forward with the business. And so if you have a private concern and you're creating and you expect to keep it as a private concern, that's wonderful. Sometimes those business uh, uh, you know, home, uh, home business. We lost you for just a minute there, Jim. Can you uh, uh, repeat sometimes, that sentence? Uh, sometimes uh, these, are, these are lifestyle businesses. That's not necessarily a criticism. Those lifestyle businesses that are going to be permanently owned by their founders, there can be wonderful businesses, but you'd manage them for a different outcome. You'd manage them for annual return. And uh, rather than manage them to show that the potential for an outside investor can grow the business exponentially. Great. Thanks, Jim. So uh, on the next slide, I have another nine points that uh, really represent a business evaluation checklist. And this is the business evaluation that an angel investor would go through, a business development team would go through. Uh, and and uh, as a team is formed, and Hillary is going to talk about this, uh, if you were to present nine slides to uh, a potential investor or for, to a company uh, to explain what you're trying to do and why you should be ready to receive help of some kind or an investment of some kind, this is a checklist which I think represents the bulk of what you need to have there. And let me just take uh, describe briefly what these nine points represent. The first is a problem statement. That is, what problem are you, with your company or your invention, going to solve that exists in the marketplace? Example for Obi, people don't really know how much food they're gonna, their pet food is eating on a regular basis. What's their consumption rate? Step number two, what's your solution? How is your solution innovative? What problem are you really solving? And can you describe what your solution is in a clear and concise manner? The third question is your proof of concept. And that is, when you've taken your idea to your potential audience, do you have demonstration that they really want it? Uh, this is a way of, so this. you do this initially with friends and family, and, but then as we expand, we take the idea quantitatively to consumers and show them the idea, and hopefully they're demonstrating that what you have created is a really interesting idea. The fourth point is what's your business model? And that's your revenue model, who are you going to get paid by, and what's your margin and structure, and also the supply chain. Where is your product going to come from? What relationships do you have to supply your product? Who's going to make it? Do you have contract agreements, uh, the supply agreements? The next point is, what's the competitive insulation? Now, often that takes the form of intellectual property, like a patent or a license for a technology that you're incorporating in your product. It could be a first mover. Look, I'm the first person to do this, and it's something that if we do it fast enough and big enough, we'll own it. Uh, do you have trademarks? Uh, do you own them? Have they been registered? Is there, any, is there a license agreement in place for an, for an ingredient? The next is, uh, so people want to know, investors want to know that they have some protection from competitive duplication, easy competitive duplication if they're going to invest. The next is who's on your management team, and that's the core group that you have. What's their experience? Often, management team assessment is the first assessment and most heavily weighted assessment that investors look at when they're making a, an investment. Uh, do these people really have the passion in their eyes? Do they have a realistic expectation? And are they doing the right things? And are they responsive to the questions that we're asking? And are they, quote, coachable? The seventh is a PL. and l what, what do the numbers look like on the business? What are the financials? Usually we like to see three-year projections on a theoretical basis. Uh, and included in the PL would be number eight, and that is how much capital is required to expand the business now, capital will come in the form of tranches, uh, meaning you'll get some capital early to help get to the next phase of development. Then you maybe will have another round of capital that will help you with expansion into regional markets or into a target market. And then there may be a third or fourth round of capital that expands the business greater uh, on a greater basis. 
And the way that we raise money is through the offering, which is point nine. So if you're trying to raise money today, what is your offering? Are you looking for a debt investment? Are you looking for equity? Are you looking for some kind of uh, uh, something else? And implicit in that is, is how much do you think your company is worth today? Uh, and uh, how does this investment make sense to the investor's perspective? Because investors want to generate a return on their investment, and they think that by investing in your company, they're going to create value for themselves as well as through your company. And finally, the, ne the next slide is, and here's the, the secret, if you will, uh, Internal innovation is very hard in large companies, and they're always looking for new ideas. Uh, in fact, sometimes those of us who worked in big comp work in big companies are embarrassed by that email or call that comes from the CEO that says, hey, did you see this new thing? What do you think of it? Who's behind it? What, you know, are, have we been tracking it? What do you know about them? And our goal is to, uh, as, as innovators in the industry, is to be on people's radar. They may or may not ever invest in us, but they're the smart people, and they're very smart people in the industry, and some of the people at Purina, the people at Purina are as smart as anybody in the industry, if not smarter. They're very committed to innovation. That's why they're doing this prize. And they want to know what's going on out there because, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, innovation has changed the industry completely. It will continue to. And products like what Hillary is doing with Obi are just yet, a, yet another example of how the industry is going to be changing. And, and Hillary is going to tell you about that in a minute. But that's my basic overview on what people are looking for and what the elements are. I guess one last thing is not all of the elements on this checklist come together in that sequence. But <laughs> all of it's not a linear things, process. It's not a linear process. It's, it, it's a grab bag. But you, you need to know that you, we, need to, uh, we need to understand together that you need to do all these things somewhere along the way, and it will happen out of sequence, and you're going to change and adapt, but more importantly, uh, all the pieces will need to be there before you'll be able to have thoughtful conversations with serious investors. So, Jim, a question from Kelly. Um, uh, what Can you kind of talk a little bit about problem statement versus opportunity. So a lot of entrepreneurs will see what they call an opportunity. Can you talk about what the difference might be between those two and maybe give an example from one of your past um, adventures? Uh, adventures? Well, uh, sure. A, a problem statement or an opportunity uh, is, uh, is it's, both, it's, it's both sides of the same coin. Uh, if there is an unfulfilled need, if there's an unaddressed need in the marketplace, that could be described as both a problem that consumers have that is being unfulfilled, or an opportunity that a company has to provide a product that others uh, are not currently providing. Uh, I mean, the OB example is a good one. There's no way to quantitatively know how much food your pet is consuming or how much water they're consuming unless you have some kind of reporting system and a device, and OB does that. Great. What um, can you? Uh, is there a, a good way to like just walk through kind of quickly what um, what these things might be like? So I'm thinking about you know so something like when you did the Rachel Ray work. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to kind of talk through each of these nine things at a very high level? I mean, obviously we don't want you to do any you know share anything that would still be confidential with any of your business partners on that but to kind of give a you know kind of um, give a specific example so that this comes to life because i think this is really valuable this was um, for those listening this jim actually um this is um, a very highlighted version of the session that he did on the very first day of our pet care innovation prize uh, boot camp last year so this is tremendously valuable um, was well, rated very highly by all the finalists. So could you just kind of walk through a specific example, maybe? Well, sure. Uh, uh, we, we developed uh, the Rachel Ray Nutrish product introduction in close collaboration with Ainsworth Pet Care, a client of ours. Uh, and one of the things that we were doing is working with their team to understand new and emerging trends in consumer attitudes about pet food and through the years we've often seen the pet industry respond to 
nutrition trends in human food and apply them to pet food. And we've always thought about the idea, and we've heard consumers talking about, and even seen companies being formed that were uh, menu driven, right? They were developing recipes for pet food that were based on human expectations and ideas. So we had the idea based on talking with consumers that if there was a food expert who had credibility that put together a pet food product, that could be a, a very good idea. Our solution was to enter into a licensing agreement with Rachel Ray, who is very well loved by her audiences. And uh, you know, at the time, I wasn't a big fan of Rachel's only because I don't sit at home at nine in the morning and watch her show. But she's got a strong following and she's known for her food and her commitment to pets. So we took our opportunity that we had identified and that is an opportunity to create homemade recipes for pet foods, put it under the umbrella of Rachel Ray, who is a well-known food expert and committed pet lover. And so we tested that proof of concept, both in terms of the elements of the idea, as well as what she added uh, with consumers, and they really liked it. And it broke through. The business model for that was it was a product that could be added to the portfolio at uh, Ainsworth. Uh, we took it initially to uh, Walmart and said this could be, we could start with you guys. Walmart loved it. The competitive installation was the trademark license from Rachel Ray and Trish. We had in place an established management team that was already doing hundreds of millions of dollars in the pet food item aisle. They had uh, the ability to invest and the capital requirement, and so they self funded the expansion of the product. So that's an example of how larger companies might do innovation, but I can also tell you that companies like Ainsworth and companies like Purina and companies like Gills are always out there looking for the next innovation. And sometimes if you come to them with a, an innovative solution or a branding idea, they might run with it. Great. Thank you, Jim. I think that's a, a Perfect segue. If you have questions, Jim is going to be available and there'll be time for questions to both Hillary and Jim. Um, as we wrap up, but Jim, this will give you a, a chance to uh, clear your throat, get a drink of water, and uh, and um, hear what uh, Hillary's going to Yeah, let, let Hillary talk for a little bit. Um, Hillary Jensen um, is uh, from the Bay Area, but she is currently in Cincinnati. Uh, she, uh, after winning the Pet Care Innovation Prize, last year and uh, we got to spend some time with her. Um, she has been growing and doing some uh, some uh, some great things, but she has just recently been accepted by the Brandery, which is an accelerator program in Cincinnati, Ohio, started, um, as many people know, there's a tremendous tradition of consumer packaged goods companies in Cincinnati because of uh, uh, Procter & Gamble's um, leadership there. Uh, and they kind of uh, really kind of um, have t have been a leader in developing the idea of category and product management um, as it relates to consumer packaged goods. But Hillary uh, is the founder of Obi. Obi is a smart bowl, an app that allows you to really uh, communicate with um, your pet and their and their and their tummy. I guess you would say. Um, and she is going to take over now. Now, Hillary, you're going to share your slides um, on your screen. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and give you screen access. Um, Try this. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I can hear you. And I just said. Um, um, hmm. Well. Um, is it allowing you to take over? It says, please wait while the presenter loads. I don't know what that means. Hmm. Suddenly I'm supposed to have uh, an app that I didn't know. Um. Well, I think this is a really good in, in, uh, example of entrepreneurship where things yeah. happen that you don't expect. 
Yes, and praying in front of your laptop so the video comes up. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh. Upload from computer. Okay, I'll just upload it really quickly. Thankfully, I'm oh, at 100 gig. Okay, so I, I believe, do you want it to be your full screen? Uh, Sorry, everybody, while we sure. do this. Yeah. There you are. Oh, okay, I was just uploading it. Um, can you see the OB on the screen? I do not. Not yet. Okay, well, I just uploaded my... my there we um, go. You got it. You got it. There we go. There you go. Okay. Thanks oh, we had it. Patience. I feel like the problem child. Don't worry. And so so you, just start in, you just started in, at the brandery today, right? So literally, you have a lot going on today. So we're grateful that you're, you're able to make some time <laughs> for us. So. Um, yeah, well, that's my excuse. But yeah, so I arrived um, last night. And um, my all of my, as you guys can, I'm sure, relate, is all of my clocks are at different times right now. So, um, so thanks for your patience. Um, I wanted to relate my my story to very much to Jim's uh, slides, and you know the beginning of um, the beginning of my company started long before I incorporated, um, and was inspired by my dog DJ. Can you see him? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, and DJ, as you can see here, is a very handsome boy, and Muttweiler um, was my inspiration, and um, I used to joke around and call him Obi Dog Kenobi, and literally one, I think it was Christmas vacation, I just looked up to see if the Obi Dog Kenobi URL was um, reserved, and it wasn't, and so I was like, are you kidding me? I think it's the best idea. So um, long story short, I ended up, started thinking about what, um, you know, my love of hardware, so embedded software and technology in my experience, and then also how to better the life of my dog, DJ, um, and then also my own life because I'm a very busy person um, who loves her dog, um, you know, incredibly. So unfortunately, well, I'll tell you later, but um, the... So with Obi Dog Kenobi, I mean, it's kind of funny in that I thought that, that we'd start um, with that as the business name. Um, and I would recommend to everyone that you do do a trademark search, that you do do, um, and then you also patent whatever you can as early as you can. Um, you know, and there's a provisional pat patent process, all of the things that I learned about as I went along. Um, I was told not to use Obi Dog Kenobi as the brand name. And it's, you know it's been fine, um, just because in particular Disney owns um, Obi Wan Kenobi and uh, are particularly litigious. And so if I had any any degree of success, that I would probably you know face some consequences. <laughs> so that made um, it made a lot of sense. It's also pretty specific. So um, it was more the idea of um, that ever present neutral advisor and ever powerful advisor that we want to be. And so over time, when we were, uh, when I was creating the product and figuring out what we were going to create, the, the name evolved into OB, and OBE is the root of the word obesity and obedience. And so you can see how the name of the company, really, or the C Corp, um, which we created, gave us some room to move um, into different areas, and that we believe that that was going to be the brand. Um, depending on what we went into, and I still didn't have a final product, even when we created C Corp. So um, you can be an LLC, by the way. It just one of the challenges is if you want venture capital, um, typically people, venture capitalists don't uh, would prefer that you are not an LLC, and they prefer that you're a C Corp, and in particular, so.
people feel free to so ask me. Hil and, so. and Hillary, just to kind of introduce you a little bit, I mean, so your background was you you did product development and product management for tech companies. So when you said, I mean, it wasn't just that you had this idea of this name and something was going to come from it. You had already, you were already in that space of understanding, like there's an inkling of something here and let's start figuring it out and let's start um, creating a framework for that, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so I have over 20 years of experience and I had a, um, was in the, my first startup was a bioinformatics startup that we sold to Solera. Um, I have my MBA from Harvard. Um, and then have in consumer being in consumer internet business for a very long time, and then um, was introduced to hardware, mobile apps, and um, embedded software hardware um, at Symantec when I was um, we were creating a residential gateway, um, which we called Codename Home. Um, and if you can uh, imagine, there's also there's a Google Home now, so uh, we were. <laughs> a little early on that at the same time. Uh, the reason I left is it was hard. It is hard to innovate in large companies. Um, and so it is much easier to do it on your own um, in, in some ways, right? And that's, I think, bootstrapping, and that's the reason we're talking about it. So back to the, the ideation was how can I create, uh, how can I solve some, some pro basic problems that I have? Um, and when I looked into it, I said, is this a problem that other people have? And how big is the market size? Because market size is extremely important for, like, if, you know, if your rule of thumb is you're going to get 1% of the overall market, number should be um, a very significant number. So in 2016, we, um, the pet market, I was really surprised to learn how much uh, people spend. So 68 billion spent in 2016, projected to be 80 billion in 2020, and then we just reached um, 100 billion worldwide in the pet market. And you guys probably all know that. But um, and then over time, it's not like this market has stayed static. Um, so we've seen a huge, um, a quick change from um, or traveling of smart home technology over into pet tech. That wasn't the case three years ago. And also, the challenge for uh, pet retailers, which is that all, about 10% of pet retail is done online. And then, in addition to that, the demand for personalization and humanization of the pet, but also the characteristics of their pet food. I, I just want to point out uh, while you switch this next slide. Hillary, that if you have questions about any of that stuff, anybody listening, uh, John Gibbons, um, if you go to the PetCareInnovationPrize.com website, John Gibbons uh, gives a great overview of that market that Hillary is describing there. There's a great presentation on that that you can look at his slides as well as see the video of his um, of his session. Um, and uh, and also the other sessions that we've done will touch on this, but there's uh, these are all valid numbers that we've seen from other people. Yeah, and so um, I'll, the, I went back to the other slide is just um, to mention that millennials. Um, so this is a millennial with doing a, having a creating a selfie with his pet. Um, millennials are not only the largest pet owning generate or largest generation; they're the largest pet owning generation. I did not know that at the time we started, and it's just you know some things start working to create momentum for the problem that you're solving, or they don't. Um, so we, I spent a lot of time on product definition and design, and then also concept testing. I didn't know what uh, necessarily what product we were going to create, and um, did. And so since my background is consumer uh, consumer work, did um, quantitative and qualitative testing with a variety of consumers, even nationwide, to verify that there was a market people were willing to pay. And then worked with a great uh, industrial design team to tell the story of the product and what we wanted to be, what it, we wanted it to be. So here's an example um, where we created personas and um, understood what problems we were going to solve um, based on that consumer work that helped us prioritize it. So from there, um, and this, this sounds linear, but it, it, a lot of it was in parallel. I was also working on creating prototypes here, um, and it's very much um, 
multiple prototypes it started by hacking hardware and i know a lot of people are probably just in, in a very different business but it's just like anything where you start small um, and simple and then gradually get into the um, the working model that reflects what you want to sell um, along the way and this is something i would encourage is you don't have to have a finished product necessarily to spike interest and we got a lot of press coverage just by um, letting people know what we were doing. Um, we auditioned for Shark Tank and, uh, you know, other things that uh, helped get some momentum and then also helped us with consumer orders. And along that line, so it's not like I wanted to bootstrap the whole time. Um, we did do an Indiegogo campaign and uh, successfully raised $53,000. It was a lot of time. And um, I don't know necessarily that I would recommend crowdfunding for everyone. Um, and you should think about it because it does create that liability over time of needing to deliver that product. So you should be pretty close and sure of your timeline. Um, and then the other part is so many customers or so many people have not delivered on their product that crowdfunding is a little, little stale right now. So, um, Consumer testing is a lot different than having customers. <laughs> and so, um, Indeed. Right, <laughs> right, right from um, right after we were fortunate enough to win the grand prize for pet care innovation, or right before, right, I guess as we were doing it, um, we were launching our closed beta to our Indiegogo customers, and that has been um, humbling, but also incredibly valuable. And so this is an example of a pug who is very um, weight sensitive and one of the problems of how we solve their problem, which is with our say when technology. So I just I want to uh, how are we doing on time, Dan? You're OK. You're OK. Um, so, I mean, the three things we thought we were going to solve a whole bunch more and create a very robust product. I think we um, we had that robustness in our beta, but then we realized we could boil things down. So um, along the way, we've made partnerships. Uh, we applied for a beta uh, test with Amazon Dash Replenishment. We were accepted. We were one of the first 10 partners. We were also featured um, by Amazon in their um, in a video that they created. All the stuff that you know is luck, right, and is um, good fortune, but then uh, is also a ton of work. You know, 14 people showed up at my house um, <laughs> to create to create a video, and it takes time away um, from, you know, from what you might also want to be doing, which is creating and talking to customers, or creating your product and talking to customers. Um, but that has been a very helpful partnership to have, and it has, and really was opportunistic in that we, um, just continued to build a relationship with the product manager there. Um, and the other part that I would say is, here are the three problems, because I think everyone's alluded to it, but one is, it's a bigger problem than people know, that um, whether you have fed the dog or not, there's a lot of pain and suffering that goes around um, back and forth. Did you feed the dog? I don't know. Did, you know, who fed the dog? How much did you feed the dog? And we solve that problem. And um, so for people with busy lives, with multiple people in the house, um, we keep it all straight for them. The other part is how much do you feed your pet? Um, so we what ha we have what we call say when technology. As you're filling the bowl, um, we measure how much you're putting into it. And we tell you when to stop uh, filling the bowl. The light, the bottom of the bowl turns green. And then third um, is auto replenishment. People run out of pet food, and they uh, they don't mean to, uh, but they, they do. And there's a ton of research that supports that. So starting with the partnership with Amazon, and then we have other partnerships with um, other large retailers, uh, we are you know, rolling that out um, to, to do smart delivery. So we mentioned team, and the team has evolved over time. Um, I think a lot of people have, you know, all of this stuff, like they have varying degree. Everyone has an opinion that I think 
space that is really reflects their own personal experience and their own bias. So take um, people's advice for what you can um, learn from it, and mostly the positive part. The number of times that I was told that this was a bad idea is probably equal to the number of times that I've been, you know, told that this was a good idea. Um, and I, <clears throat> I leveraged people I trust. So Julian King, in fact, is um, one of my former bosses from Earthlink way back when, um, and in fact is also the one of the reasons that I was so excited about the brandery because his training is in Proc uh, from Procter and Gamble. Um, and the thing that I would say is about your advisors is um, leverage people who will give you time. Um, that's been my strategy. Um, can I call them at the last minute and say, hey, look, we're trying to negotiate this agreement and I don't understand X. You know, they're friendly people, meaning that they aren't necessarily investors. They maybe they are probably shareholders, but they will give you the answers to those stupid questions that you might be afraid to ask uh, board members, for example. Um, and then well, and even and even and even at least one of these people, when you were at Global Pet, you know, agreed to stand in your booth for you when you needed a bathroom break. I mean, they're they're decent people too. It's not it's not just that they're smart people. They're, they're very smart people. Yeah, and Dr. War, you know, and they and that they believe in you. And so we have three veterinarians on our board. Um, they're very much, uh, and you know, several of them have reached out to us um, just because they believe in what we're doing. And then um, developers are also, of course, important. And so Dimitri um, is joining us from Russia, believe it or not, um, tomorrow. So awesome. And here we are. So um, it looks maybe with all the logos and stuff like it was easy, but it's been a um, you know quite an adventure. And the part that I think a lot of people may not realize is that it can be a lonely road um, and your team is certainly uh, an, an important part of helping you through that. Um, but no matter what, you're going to have challenging times and uh, it's, it would be nice if it all were easy, but um, it's also a really fantastic challenge. That's me. So, so uh, uh, the question has um, come up. You know, so talk a little bit about where you are. So, are you still in closed beta? Is it possible to buy? Where where are you selling? Are you you know because you are so closely tied to food? Do you do it as a standalone, or is it kind of like the idea of like the HP model with inkjet printers that you basically give away a printer because you know that they'll sell people will buy cartridges for the rest of their life? Is that the goal with the OB feeder? You know, the OB bowl to get to that kind of relationship, or talk a little bit about how you are as far as sales now? Um, so we have, I'm not going to give numbers out, but um, we have a substantial number of pre-orders um, and we've shipped to our Indiegogo first um, beta. So that was the other thing is we structured our um, Indiegogo uh, campaign around betas. So we called them Pro Bowl Pioneers, set people's expectations that they would be betas. They've been incredibly forgiving for that reason. Um, and also uh, not only forgiving, but then really supportive. Like, here's a better idea. Here's what I need. Um, and you know, we have had the other part about opening it up is that we've had great examples of things that we never knew would be matter uh, would matter. So, for example, one of our customers has a traumatic brain injury, um, and his beloved Jack Russell Terrier Jack um, can try to convince him that he's been fed, um, <laughs> that he hasn't been fed. <laughs> and he can't tell. He doesn't know. And so he had this elaborate system um, set up, and he was so excited to learn about the Pro Bowl. So he's also been, you know, a very demanding but also very supportive customer. Um, so, and you're and you're kind of also tying into a trend that's that's bigger than just you. That the idea of, of obesity and pet obesity is becoming something that a lot of pet parents are aware of, right? So. It's not that you're preying on that fear, but your your people are getting your value proposition because of that. I would say yes and no. Um, you know, even though our name is Ob, um, people don't like to be told that their pet is fat. Um, so mm -hmm. we stay away from it. Um, 
you know, we are, and that was part of the consumer research. And it makes sense, right? It's like um, maybe a little bit different than telling you that your child is ugly, but it's pretty similar to a lot of people. They get offended. They, um, and so the, pro the whole goal is, and it's straightforward, tell people how much to feed their pet. They don't necessarily know. Solve um, the, their problems in their busy lives. Make it convenient and easy to feed their pets the right amount and then make recommendations on how best to care for their pet that's breed specific, age specific, um, all around nutrition. Um, that's what our value is and is growing. We are um, seeking funding right now, um, trying to raise uh, money in order to go to mass production. So we, and one of the reasons that we joined the brandery is so that we can uh, be introduced to uh, more investors and then also be, um, you know, the brand is so important to the product, meaning customer experience, how we communicate, what we do, that um, it's certainly experience that I didn't necessarily have and that I'd love more input on. So hope that answers your question. Great. I want to open it back up to Jim. And uh, Jim, pet tech is a new kind of category. You know, Internet of Things is going on and um, um, and uh, you know, people are starting to do these things. And and uh, at Global Pet, there were several other um, smart bowls or bowls that were connected to the internet in ways. So, what do you think is the differentiator uh, for Hillary as she moves forward? So, you know, so because I'm sure some other people listening to this um, also see themselves as being in the pet tech space or somewhat the tech-enabled pet care space. Do you have a sense of what that looks like? Have you seen anything? Would you, do you, you know, do you, uh, um, do you have an opinion in that area? Well, I think that there, yeah, <clears throat> I have an opinion. I may not really have any expertise, but my opinion is that uh, Hillary's business idea rests on a couple of very strong trends, and she identified them. First, uh, People want to know how to care for their pet, and this is a cool tool to help them do it. And second, uh, the idea that there's a possibility of replenishment as part of this system really appeals to uh, her potential partners in expansion. And uh, the Internet of Things, of course, is part of this world. And I think that she is building a business on some very, very interesting propositions. To her last point, now she needs to demonstrate that uh, with some capital, she can actually create a large customer base and can deliver products which are actually being successful and used in homes. The thing that I admire about what Hillary has done is she has listened very, very carefully to a variety of input. And when you go through the list of presentations and people she's been in front of, it's been remarkable how many people she's listened to and talked to. And the hard part, and I, I have back for her, is, Hillary, how do you decide who you listen to? You touched on that a little bit, but uh, it's, it's, there is the businesses. Let me just say this another way. What we think we start off with as our product idea when we start a company very rarely ends up as the key answer as the key solution that's successful as a product in the marketplace. The hard part of being an entrepreneur and starting one of these things is to separate and understand what the core idea is for your product from what the product is itself and make sure that you don't force people to buy something that they don't want. And that's the hard part of listening as to what the people really want in your product idea and who's going to be the driving customer for your expansion. Yeah, Hillary, would you talk a little bit about, you mentioned that trust was really important, but, I mean, you trust your grandmother, and, um, you know, I hope I hope you have a grandmother you can trust, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, from advisors and everything, how do you figure out how to, you know, because lots of people are like, oh, no, you should be this, you should be that. How do you figure out that, you know, how do you uh figure out who to trust and, and to, how do you move forward with that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, that's why I picked people. So I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that um, 
that research shows is that um, hiring your friends is not a great idea. Hiring your family is not a great idea for the success of your um, for the sex, success of your startup. Um, those people, um, and you look look at the research, it shows that people you are likely to have more success with people you've worked with before. Um, so I very much follow, um, followed that uh, that degree. The other part is making it clear about roles. So don't do 50-50 equity, for example. Um, but it, what it goes to is both Jason and Julian, um, and now Dimitri as well, are people who I've worked with before, and I've seen them deliver. They've had incredible success. Um, and so they're diplomatic when they disagree with me. Um, you know, I put stock into it. Um, my husband, uh, fortunately, has a lot. He, I mean, you know, he listens and patiently, and he has um, some different ideas than I do. And I try to, I, you know, I'm a person who will listen to it and sleep on it, and that's how I make decisions. Um, but the number of times that uh, a very credible person has told me not to do something, and then I've done the other part, is done the gone the other way, is you know pretty. It's not not that uncommon. Um, and that is, so trust your gut, know how you make good decisions, um, and I happen to mull things over. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so you, you have to kind of know yourself to know how not to react, but to consider those things, and then to still, you, but it sounds like you need to, your perspective is you need to still have this vision, like you don't know exactly how you're going to get there, but you're continually like, so you're, you're testing things of, is this vision that people get how this is technology and food and the user experience coming together? And if they get that, then there's probably some truth to listen to there. Would that be a fair way to say it? Yeah, I think it's fair. And then the other part is that investors have their own bias, right? Um, so some person told me that, you know, the first mover in hardware is always going to win. Well, you know, there are plenty of examples where that's just not the true, uh, not true, like Apple. Um, the iPhone, for example, but um, uh, or their own biases of what they want to invest in, like cars versus pets, and so mm -hmm. their their opinion, knowing kind of what what that is and what their bias might be, um, helps as well. Yeah, so I just because that's their bias doesn't mean that should be your bias. Correct, yeah, and it doesn't right. mean that a hundred billion dollars isn't being spent on pets. Yeah. Let Go me ahead, add Jim. to that, Dan. Uh, pardon me for interrupting, but I think you guys are on a, an important point. And I had some a lot of firsthand experiences with this. Was we were building our beverage company, and people who aren't going to invest in your company will give you all kinds of reasons why they're not. You really shouldn't pay too much attention to that. Most of them are just being polite and asking you to go away. But Hillary talked about the experience with one of her beta customers who became very, very passionate about the product and had a unique application for it. Those are the people that we really need to be careful to listen to because it's the heavy users, it's the people who are already invested in your product and love it, trying to figure out what really motivates them and trying to make more of them is more important to center on than people who give you advice as you drive by and show them your product. All right, that's a great point. We're, um, we got started just just a few minutes late, so we're going to have to wrap up. But why don't we uh, finish that? And I think we have one more question coming in, and then we're going to have to wrap up, Hillary. If you want to finish um, that thought. Cool. Well, what I was going to say is that um, a lot of people will flatter you, um, and a lot of times they flatter you, think it's a great brand, great idea, but they often want you to spend money with them. So yes. um, it can it can be. <laughs> It can, you can really, you know, I was like, oh, these guys are great. But um, that was something that I've learned now is that they're much more likely to want you to spend money uh, with them. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I want to just, uh, um, um, what, uh, the question came up, how is Obi really different than the other smart bowls or the other people that are doing internet connected bowls out there? What do you think that uh, is your differentiator? Because that's fundamentally your, what kind of keeps you moving, right? 
otherwise you would see these other bowls would be like, oh, somebody else has done it and I just need to do a cheaper one. So what really drives you? Well, I mean, I would say that there's really only one bowl out there um, that's really a smart bowl and depend to how, um, and that means that it's Wi-Fi connected. So there are a bunch of people who say that they are smart and they, one, they may have an app, but they're not, um, they don't serve that purpose of giving you real time um, updates about, um, about your pet with predictive health analytics like we do. Um, and then the other part is that we have partnerships um, and we're first to market with um, other partners who, um, who our main competitor is not. Um, mm -hmm. And that has been, um, the that's the major differentiator for, um, for I think, B2B play. Um, mm -hmm. And then the B2C play is that we, we answer needs um, like that reassurance, telling people, being the neutral advisor, telling them, um, giving them advice, uh, and then the other ones, just weigh your food, for example. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not a solution. All right. Great. Well, you know, and I, I want to give you some props because uh, um, one of the, uh, the uh, people at Nine Square Ventures, the venture arm of Nestle Purina Pet Care, um, when we were talking about you, immediately said, this is the problem we have in my house. Our dog gets fed four times every morning. Um, and uh, so, you know, you understood that those kind of need things, it's not just a combination of hardware and an app that displays some data. It's, ac it's actually understanding how people interact with it. So congratulations on that. Um, we're going to wrap up here. Um, uh, this has been a presentation uh, by uh, both PetAge. Um, and the Pet Care Innovation Prize. The Pet Care Innovation Prize was started last year. We're in our second year. Um, you can apply at PetCareInnovationPrize.com, and we offer cash and um, and uh, business support to help uh, early stage pet care companies grow. Uh, we had five finalists last year, and they are all doing very well. Um, and uh, and uh, Hillary with Obi was the grand prize winner, but all of them got a chance to spend a week. Um, here in St. Louis, spend time on the Nestle Purina Pet Care campus, learning from their, they have some amazing resources, um, doing a boot camp on learning how to grow their business, as well as helping them make uh, connections that they need to grow. So this year's competition uh, is open right now. Applications close on August 4th. You can apply online. Um, Hillary and Jim, thank you very much. This has been great content that really helps uh, um, educate a lot of people and also help people I think understand some of the uh, some of the character and, and tenacity that's required in doing this um, we're going to post your slides uh, if you um, uh, if uh, if you can contact Hillary or Jim their contact information will actually be with their slides um, so you'll be able to go to petcareinnovationprize.com um, to see these slides and also to listen to a recording this recording uh, this session has been recorded and it's archived there um, thank you very much. Thank you to our friends at PetAge for helping support this. Um, any uh, closing remarks? Or are you just ready to go and uh, go go uh, go on to the day, Jim? Any anything that you'd like no, to wrap up with? Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And Hillary, anything from your end? Um, I would just say that the Pet Care Innovation Prize um, and then the network that I created just or that I was lucky enough to um, create because of the week in St. Louis has been amazing. Um, there are people who I never would have met before and now I have a, a supportive network um, beyond just my own um, previously existing one. And then I thought I knew everything about the pet industry. No, I'm kidding. I mean, I thought I knew a lot. Um, I know a ton more after that week. Great. Well, thank you, Hillary, and uh, good luck. We look forward to uh, maybe getting a post on our website sometime as you uh, as you go through the brandery experience to see how you're developing. And um, uh, but uh, we know you're busy, and we know Jim, you're busy, and uh, we thank you for your time. And with that, I'm going to close. Uh, this has been Dan Roos, and thanks for joining us, everybody.